This week, I'm talking with Matthew Holland, the founder and CEO of Field Effect Security. For the past decade, Matt's been the guy that every three-letter agency in the Western world has called when they have a problem that they can't solve. Before Matt started Field Effect, he enabled allied governments to pursue their lawful mandate. This episode is all about cybersecurity, exploits, hacking, and defending. And while this is a world we all hear a lot about, rarely are the people talking as knowledgeable and informed as Matt. In fact, I'd say he's one of the top three in the world at what he does. Let's dive into the mind of an attacker, what's possible, and what questions you should ask your cybersecurity vendor. Along the way, we'll talk about Snowden, what it's like to work at an intelligence agency, and of course, Huawei and national security. It's time to listen and learn. What are we drinking? This is a Highland Park 30. Is there a story behind this? It's delicious. Uh, aside from I find it a, a very nice combination of smoky and uh, sherry, there's not much of a story. It's just, it is really, really good. You're the guy who got me into scotch. Mm. After like three years of trying everybody's favorite scotch, you just gave me one. I was like, oh, this is good. And then all of a sudden I like scotch, but the, the key is non PD. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, so, you know, people in Scotland would probably hate me uh, because you know, the flavor profiles there that tend to, I guess, stand out more smoky and PD, but I just don't like that stuff. So everything you had tried up until then was probably just those. Smoky uh, or PD. Yeah. But man, I, a good sherry whiskey is just amazing. Absolutely amazing. It is. It's totally, it's changed my view of all scotch and whiskey. That's great. I, th I think it makes you a better person. Well, I try. <laughs> so uh, I've known you since, what, 1999 we met? 2000? Yeah, around then, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, world. We used to work together at the intelligence agency. Yep. And then that was the most insane period of time ever, right? We're in this small team. September 11th happens. The world forever changes. Our team works nonstop for effectively seven years. Like I don't remember any of us having vacation from 2001 to 2008 other than like a random Monday or something. Yeah. I mean, firstly, I think vacation is probably largely overrated just because I'm a workaholic. Um, but yeah, no, it, it was a really neat way to, to start. Uh, I, I mean, our career was, you know, just a year or two apart, but it is. It was definitely a, a very interesting experience being thrust into a an environment where everything you do contributes much more than you would ever think. Because coming out of university, you know, you're you want to get a job with a good salary. All of a sudden, you're, you know, in, in our case, we're doing things that actually matter to the country that have a very significant outcome, and uh, it. it it's like going from zero to mature <laughs> very, very, very quickly. Overnight. Yeah. Yeah. I remember one of the first meetings I had with you, uh, we were trying to figure out how something worked and I stood up, you know, in my university sort of bravado and I was like, oh, I'll tell you how this works. And then I spent like 30 seconds explaining this thing. And then you looked at me and just deadpanned, like, you're absolutely wrong. Here's how it works. You stood up and for 45 minutes, you worked through like every instruction that happened in the operating system. And I was just blown away by your level of knowledge. I mean, that's kind of you to say. Um, I, I, there's probably a factor of uh, blown away uh, at how much of a jerk I was uh, in the process <laughs> of that, which I'd like to say has changed, but probably not so much. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it was, it was a really, uh, it was cool. I, I think the environment that we, we got to work in was learning from people. Um, the, uh, you know, for me that, that time in my life really defined what a good team was, um, characteristics like, you know, you care about, you know, when you learn something, you share it with other people in the yeah. office. I, I remember, you know, there was five or six of us in particular at one point where, you know, it was a very large research, uh, focused group. And anytime you learn something or I learn something or one of our colleagues learned something, it, it was a really neat discovery, but we took the time to educate each other. And I think what that fostered was a team that, you know, a level of trust that I, I had never experienced in my life. Uh, I remember, you know, entering that team being massively humbled. Uh, and, you know, once, once the ego got dealt with uh, and, you know, you could really jump into that environment, it just, it, it catapults one's growth. And, and I still look back to those times and, and consider myself extremely lucky. And um, 
I guess, always acknowledge that, that that time in my life largely defined who I am today. I want to come back to that in a second. I remember it, it's weird to hear you say sort of like you were humbled. You are literally the best in the world at what you do. And we're going to come back to that throughout this interview. Is it um, drinking whiskey? <laughs> you're pretty good at that. too. <laughs> um, I remember showing up like you used to drive me all the time in your Mazda. What was that? The it was the MX six, buddy. The MX six. That, that was that was the uh, smelled like toffee nut latte. Yeah, yeah, no, that was the that was the dream cybermobile. <laughs> oh we spent a lot of time together. Um, what made you leave? Like, why? So I I I, I reflect on that quite a bit, um, just because I get that question often, and I, I don't think I've ever really had a good answer that that wasn't necessarily. Uh, Immature. Um, the ultimate reason I left was because I, I saw a limit to what I could grow into and what the vision of the group I was in uh, achieving. What like th there was a ceiling arbitrarily put on top of that, and I'm the type of person that I, I don't work well when somebody says this is as far as you can go, or this is what we're going to do regardless of what the evidence. Uh, or ideas or good ideas, bad ideas, whatever, that that stopped and, and it was not an environment that I said, I can grow here anymore. Um, one of the big indicators of that, which um, you'll probably laugh at this, but there's a there's a management competition. I screwed up the entire the entire uh, interview, but it was the same problem where somebody would ask, you know, the interviewer would ask me a question and rather than give the, the answer of, you know, I would... I would build a team to do this. I would request funding to do this. I would, uh, you know, reach out to universities to, um, you know, bring them into the into the fold. So, you know, that's the answers they wanted to hear. What I gave them were the technical responses to the questions they were asking. So, how would you solve this problem? Yeah. My answer was, well, I would do X, Y, Z. Yeah. And then I would do this. You didn't play the game. No, it was just I answered the question. And I think that was the first time it really dawned on me that I probably don't fit into the mold that they were looking for. So I think that's when I, I started to, the, I guess the, the, the ball started rolling on my departure. I remember it changed probably about eight months before you left. Like it started to get more, I don't know, I don't even know how to word this. Like when we started, it was um, very fast moving. We had a lot of authority, a lot of control, a lot of decision making power. And then slowly, as we became more successful, the irony is like that sort of became less and less over time. Yeah, I remember um, having a conversation with one of our mutual colleagues at the time, and I remember being very irritated about the um, you know the arbitrary handcuffs that were being put on our ability to, to innovate, research. Um, you know, I, I remember a contentious time that you and I actually you know, stood up at a town hall and got in a giant argument with uh, oh, a director. I that. Yeah. Uh, Stu, if you're listening, we're sorry. And, and it, it was, it was very frustrating. And I remember that colleague saying, this is just part of business, man. Like once you, once you're part of a group that does something really good and, and people take notice and they, you know, they want to turn that into a larger part of the organization. And with that comes what you're seeing now, you know, formalized, you, you can't work more than this. You, you have different reporting responsibilities. And, you know, at that time, I just, I just wanted to innovate. I just wanted to come up with new solutions to the problems that operations were, were running into. You know, not being able to do that in its raw form was extremely frustrating. So you left. And we, we can't talk about what we did there, but we can talk about what you did right after you left. And so you started uh, Lynchpin and you, you had an unconventional sort of way of, of starting that company, which is releasing... <laughs> A yeah. privilege elevation uh, to get some attention on Microsoft. You want to talk about that? Yeah. So that that was a that was a funny period. So um, you know, at the time, my my business partner and I we 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 thought, you know, how can we make a splash? Because when we left, you know, our attention was to um, you know augment the uh, the world that we left with. I guess uh, a privatized twist on things. So we thought about okay, how can we how can we really stir things up a bit? And at the time. Microsoft was releasing um, mandatory driver signing um, as part of Windows Vista, which is showing our age right there. Yeah, um, yeah. And and you know there's so much hype around it, and the way it was being advertised, what it was going to be the silver bullet to stop all malware, to stop you know anything bad that could be happening. And anybody who has spent any time, I guess, on the offensive side of the house, 
you know, was looking at that and saying, no, the, bullshit. yeah, it, it, it'll, it'll be, it'll make things better, but it's not going to be the silver bullet that everybody thinks. So we said, all right, well, why don't we just do something kind of funny and, um, you know, show them. So what we did was we wrote a tool called, uh, Den Whip Ativ. The name of the company was Den Whip Ativ, which is Vista Pooned, uh, <laughs> in reverse. Um, you know, got a signing certificate under this fake company, uh, legitimately registered fake in reality, uh, and released a tool that would load. It was an assigned component that would load an unsigned driver. And it was not to do anything other than show how easy it is with the most simplest, goofiest approach to get around this problem. And uh, so at the time I was in Australia um, with my business partner starting things up, we were working out of a closet, really kind of a ragtag uh, <laughs> setup to start. And at the time, there were uh, people being uh, arrested for violations of uh, the DMCA, uh, Digital Millennium's Copyright yep. Act, which, you know, back at that time was a really contentious thing because it was changing what people could or could not do with computers. And it was, it was a really big deal. So uh, when we released that, um, some people were like, oh, that's kind of neat. And other people are, you know, uh, one person in particular was like, this is a violation of the DMCA. You should be arrested. P.S. It's not really that cool. I'm going to go and release a tool that um, actually exploits ATI drivers and, and video drivers and then basically does the same thing. But I've done it a lot cooler. Uh, so so take that linchpin. Ha ha. Right. And, and in reality, that that was I remember that guy. Yeah, that, that was so much worse because I, and I don't know if it actually resulted in the revoking of ATI and NVIDIA's uh, signing certificate, but it, it was something that. You know, to us, it was... It was over it was the just, line. It was, well, it was stupid to say that we were violating the DMCA. And two, um, the response was just so much unbelievably worse. And it was, it was a very weird first few months of the company. Do you ever miss sort of working at the intelligence agency? I miss people. I miss a lot of really good people. Uh, yeah, they there. have amazing people. It's a very underrated. People think that uh, all sort of like government employees are lumped in the same... Same group, they're not, uh, as we can both attest to. Yeah, so so I miss the people. Uh, I miss having firsthand exposure to the mission. Um, you know, I, I think back to some of the things I got to see and be a part of uh, that, you know, no one will ever know about, and and that is really cool. It, it was really neat being a part of that. Um, it, it 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 creates memories that I'm pretty sure if I were to run into somebody 30 years from now on the other side of the world in a bar you know, immediately there's that connection of like, hey, we did that. That was really cool. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I miss aspects, but I don't miss the the handcuffs that uh, were were ultimately a part of my departure from there. And then when you left, do you, do you ever feel like there was, they didn't want you to succeed because they wanted you to come back? Was there a part of you that felt like they didn't want to give you <laughs> contracts, they didn't want to? <laughs> I, I don't know if there's any, any, interest in me coming back. I think there was definitely skepticism as to whether I could succeed, which um, it's, I'm, I'm fine with that. I mean, you know, clearly at the time, my business partner and I were the first ones to kind of make that jump and do that together. And um, there was a lot of skepticism as to whether we should be allowed to do that, whether we um, are able to do that. I, I remember having a departure interview with a Hyatt manager who sat me down and said, you're gonna go sell to China. You're gonna enable China. And I, I looked at him in the eye and I said, Are, what on earth would make you think I would ever do that? That is the most ridiculous thing ever. So so I think there was a bit of fear that we would enable, you know, adversaries of, of allied countries. Um, and which, yeah, I mean, in retrospect, I can understand. I just think it, it, at the time it was a, uh, it was an immature view. I remember going to a meeting a couple of weeks after you left and they were like, oh, we're not going to buy anything from him. And I was like, we're going to end up giving this guy like 50 million bucks a year. <laughs> I want to say I was closer to reality than they were. <laughs> well, I mean, so, so the idea of going private was taking the handcuffs off and creating an environment where we put really, really smart people together. I'm, you know, part of our recruiting strategy was immediately going after the best people in the community and taking all barriers out of their way and making, letting them do amazing things. I, I want to dive into that a little more because you were able to replicate, I mean, an entire wing of an agency, if you want, you want to say that, with one-tenth, one-twentieth the number of people 
and have higher output. How were you able to do that? You just, same people, you just took them out of the environment and what enabled that? Largely removing barriers. I mean, I think that was a big component of it. Um, you know, giving them an environment uh, that they could excel in, which, you know, breaks down into what tools do you need? Do you need to put in a purchase requisition to get what you need? Or can I just get that for you? Right. Like I, that was one of the comments uh, from one person I remember early on when they joined. They're like, OK, these are the things I'm going to need to do my job. And they're like, OK, I'll be back in 30 minutes. And here's your stuff. And the reaction was, really? Like, we can just do this? It's like, yeah, go be a genius. Go produce amazing things. So I think that was a big component. Um, I think making it clear that everything that we were doing was as a team. And uh, I, I think, as an aside, this is one thing I think people who are entrepreneurs sometimes get caught up in that it's about them. It's about their journey. And the, the, the way I approach it is, no, we're all in this together. I'm really lucky to have you in the company. and creating that environment where they knew that they were lucky that I appreciated them and that whatever we do, we're doing together. Um, I, I think it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an empowering message uh, to build a team around. I remember one of the things I took away that I've learned from you is when you started doing that with people and you were like, what equipment do you need to do your job? And you just go out and get it for them and they were astonished by how simple that was. And that's something we do with everybody here too. We just sort of like, what is it you need to do your job to the best of your ability? There's a downside to that too, which is really interesting because then you lose the excuse of the equipment's the problem. If only I had the right <laughs> tools, I could like deliver, right? Yeah. Like, so you, su there's this subtle sort of undercurrent to it, which is, uh, I expect you to be amazing at what you do and keep getting better. Yeah. I, and I mean, I, I think for some people, um, sometimes just that belief helps them get there. And so you did LPL from what, 2007 to, Seven to 18 to 2018. What are some of the lessons you learned about growing that? When you ended, how many people were there? So, so globally, I'm going to lump in the, the partner company that we, we were sold with, but I think we're at the time close to 90 to 100. Um, we sold in 2018, but I, I didn't leave until December of 2019. Uh, I want to I want to come back to that, but what are some of the lessons you learned from growing, scaling, running that company, recruiting? I think I think one of the biggest things was I, you know, starting a, a company from scratch. Um, you know, at that time, I, I I had a computer science background. I, I clearly had a lot of experience in in cybersecurity. You know, I took some accounting courses and marketing courses in university, so I think there was a bit of a foundation as to okay, if you know, I remember doing a business plan because that was one thing you did. You made a business plan. Um, but one thing through the Lynchman experience that I, that I got to have was I got to do every job. So I got to literally be the janitor. I got to be the marketing person. I got to be the primary salesperson. I remember doing, um, you know, really challenging sales pitches in front of audiences that didn't even want me in the room because I was, you know, stamping on their, their creative territory. I got to write code. I got to manage projects. Um, I got to be the, the evangelist in the company. And, you know, going from there to, to, to field effects with that, with that base, I think allows me to really, you know, make decisions that are more informed. Um, it allows me to, to, I guess, understand and appreciate all the different parts of field effect and that, which is a much more, uh, diverse well, we're going to come to field effect yeah, yeah. in a second. Um, so I think, so I think there was that, I think, um, the ability to make decisions, uh, and be confident in those decisions, not get caught in uh, you know paralysis of decision making. That that um, that is something that I think at first I, I, I struggled with, but over time, uh, the ability to to filter out the noise uh, and focus on the things that actually truly matter um, have uh, have really helped. So why'd you leave? I mean, uh, right before you left, you're the you're the guy every three letter agency and basically the allied world would call when they had a problem they couldn't solve and you would solve it why would you why leave i was gonna make a joke about they they ran out of problems but it wouldn't be funny. <laughs> they didn't no problems done uh, all problems solved. Yeah, yeah. um actually the same reason i think uh, and and this is actually where i think i realized why you know the root factor of why i left cse is it was a similar scenario where um, you guys got bought yeah yeah, but it, it was a it was a change in uh, in what I could do, 
was you know I I started to see a ceiling on what I could achieve, and it became clear to me that um, you know I was the square peg trying to fit into the round hole um, because of um, you know ambitious ambitions and and you know um, more creative things that I that I thought we could do, and that was that was actually a pretty interesting experience coming to terms that I you know I was the the square peg in the round hole because it definitely t- took time to, <laughs> yeah. you know, the you go, hole's not going to change. Yeah. yeah. And, and you go through this evolution of like, what's wrong with everybody? Why, why is nobody on board with this? And then, uh, the realization that, oh shit, it's, it's me. I'm the problem here. And then the, the appreciation of, okay, okay. Understanding why that is. And I think that, that ultimately, uh, made the transition very easy actually. Um, and and uh, it's not something that I look back with uh, at this point with any animosity or, or anything. It was just part of life. You exited with more than enough to sort of walk away for the rest of your life and just sort of like sit on a boat in Costa Rica and never have to worry again. And then... But the sharks. <laughs> there are sharks. Sharks. Yeah, yeah. But then you, you start a field of fact and how many employees are you now? Almost 100. You're almost 100. You're entirely self-funded to this point. So you basically took all this money you made and you were like, oh, I want to do this again. And I'm going to put it all on the line. Like what went into that thinking? Um, I, I, several factors. I, I think um, I, I really enjoy solving hard problems. And the, the, the current state of the cybersecurity industry to say it's a hard problem is an understatement. Um, it is a is a an, an unethical shit show, I would say, and it it really bothers me uh, where it's at. So I think there's a there's a large part of me that wants to fix that. Um, there's also the aspect of I'm like ultimately a serial entrepreneur, and and I remember chatting with my wife like when that transition was happening. She asked me like, "Why are you doing this?" And I was like, "What else am I going to do?" I'm just going to start something else. And it's either, you know, a cybersecurity company that I'm once again running that I believe can change the world and fix a lot of problems, or I can open a coffee shop. Probably going to take the same amount of time. So how about the the cybersecurity firm? And how important has she been through this? She's amazing. Um, I, I, uh, I, I don't think I, I could ever thank her enough. I, I think the... The the formula for 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 my success, um, she is a she is a huge part of that. Um, she is a fun, you're a workaholic. Yes, if you if you could if you could sample what makes her run, you know who she is, and somehow create like a vaccine and inoculate the world, like you would have world peace, uh, hands down. And and that obviously is is a strong statement. But she is a phenomenal. Anybody who knows her um, would uh, would definitely agree with that. I would agree. She's amazing. She is pretty cool. You mentioned sort of the state of the cybersecurity industry. Talk to me a little bit about that. Where are we? What's it look like? I mean, there's nobody in the world from my point of view that would have a better aperture into not only how things are, how they're sold, but also the attacker's mindset in terms of what you're buying versus what you're consuming and how it's impacting your business. This is the part in the discussion where I get angry. That's okay. We get a lot of scotch. (laughs) So... I think to answer that question, the first thing, you know, we need to do is is look at what the cybersecurity industry actually is, because I think that it gets muddled, um, the, the way the public looks at it, the way it's reported on. It's just everything. It's like a grab bag for. Yeah. So I I think there's, there's three groups or, or, or pillars of cybersecurity. There's the one, there's the offensive side, which we've talked about, the. The, the ransomware, the intelligence agencies, I, I say offensive, but the whole, it's that traditional hacking, which, um, you know, has been largely been glorified thanks to Hollywood. Um, Mr. Robot gets it right, though. I don't know if I'm, you've I remember seen. in Swordfish, he sits down like yeah. 30 seconds later, everything. Yeah, no, it's largely horseshit. Isn't that um, how it works? <laughs> <laughs> with VR goggles, yeah. Um, but if you ever seen Mr. Robot, that that is actually an accurate representation, um, if you ever uh, are curious. But it is a, you know, it is this glamorized... Uh, thing that is entirely misrepresented, but it is an economy in itself. There's an economy behind ransomware, and they get paid for it. They are successful. There's an economy behind intelligence agencies. That that, that is ultimately what drives that dollars and cents. On the defensive side, the second bit. Oh, and by the way, the first bit only exists because uh, humans are general generally horrible at writing software. Um, so that wouldn't exist if 
people are actually good at security models and implementing software. The second bit only exists because the first bit exists. So that's the defensive side. And that is, um, a, so let, let me, I guess the best way to describe it is as a consumer, it is probably the worst experience you could go, go through. So if, you, if you're going to go buy some cybersecurity, um, are you buying an antivirus? That's exactly what I want to do. I want to buy. Yeah, cybersecurity. buy some cyber. Yeah, because that that's largely because <laughs> that's it's it's a, it's it's a we're joking, it's a, but yeah, it's a black box industry, right? A, a lot of a lot of businesses, a lot of people don't know what they're actually buying, and that has been exploited by the industry. And this is the part where I get angry because none of the solutions out there 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 are a few uh, that are that are decent, but. Like, look at what your options are. Do I buy an antivirus? Do I buy any spyware? Do I buy a firewall chain? Maybe uh, an IDS, intrusion detection system. Maybe endpoint uh, detect and respond. Um, maybe uh, user behavior analysis. Maybe a network monitor. And the way that vendors will, um, you know, try to push it forward is they say, you actually need all of that, which is total crap. You do not need all of those things, they do not work well together. So that, that whole thing angers me to no end. The third bit is a, a category that isn't actually cybersecurity. Uh, I read an interesting article uh, recently and it kind of clued me in. I was like, actually, yeah, no, this third thing or pillar exists that is entirely wrong. And it's that bit that happens in you know on the internet, uh, social media, that type of thing, uh, that isn't actually security related, but people like to kind of put a buck or a box around that. So an example would be, um, you know, election interference. So how do, what are the organized, um, influence in, influential campaigns on, on social media to, to get people to vote in particular directions? I, I do not think that's cybersecurity, but that also gets lumped in. So that, that is the third bit, which is kind of like faux cybersecurity. It's a little bit confusing because then you lose track of what's actually happening. But I mean, intelligence agencies have been spying on other countries forever. One of the things that have changed now is um, not only the amount of consumer data and the value of that data, but also that people are spying on companies now as a means to fast track their R&D. Yeah. Um, wh why invest hundreds of millions of dollars when you can sort of like just hack into somebody else's computer and download all their work and then claim it as your own? You know, I mean, it, it highlights why, you know, it, people, companies need to take this this problem seriously. And, and I don't think it necessarily extends just to large companies at this point. Um, you know, legal firms, uh, accountants, huge targets, huge targets. I mean, you, you think about what they're dealing with in regards to confidential agreements, financials of individuals and companies. And, and that's one thing I think we've seen over the last couple of years is the, the attention that state-sponsored groups are going after. It's no longer, you know, the Sonys of the world. It is now your, your, your law firms because there's a lot of intelligence value there. Yeah. Um, patent firms. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot of intelligence value there. So um, the, you know, how, how seriously smaller companies need to take this threat, I think has really gone up. I find it super interesting. I mean, I was talking to KPMG just last week and they were like, oh, send me this. And I was like, oh, how do I send it to you? And they're like, just put it in an email. I was like, what, what are you talking about? Like, I'm not putting that in an email. Yeah. I, mean, I, I sort of compromised with like, I used quickforget.com and like uploaded something and it's like, this is good for like six hours. So you better download it. But um, it's amazing to me that the lack of thought that goes into the information you share and how that manifests itself or what's exposed, right? Because if somebody breaks into that computer, that whole email chain's there. Now the file's there already, but the, a lot of the emails stored in the cloud, it's a lot easier to access than people realize. Um, and what makes you wanna tackle this problem? Like this is like the greatest intractable problem ever with tons of competition. Like the government's doing host-based, you have private sector doing all of these things, cobbling together solutions. Like what makes you think that you you can have a better outcome for customers? Probably arrogance. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I joke, but that's I probably- I mean, nobody knows probably. the industry better than you do, but like seriously, there's billions of dollars going on here. Um, yeah, so I mean, if we, if we look 20 years ago, it's the same problem. Um, well, one of the things I, I tell people when they join who, you know, when I hire from intelligence agencies is that 
be prepared to be disappointed because the problems that you are going to see will shock you that, you know, that they're still out there. So the techniques that are, you know, are 10 years old are the problems that should be 10 years old are still happening today. And, you know, I think that is, that's a large referendum on how not good the cybersecurity industry is at actually trying to solve the problem. And if, and if I look at, you know, the vendors out there, I'm not going to name any specific competition, but what I see is a sales strategy that is like a warped used car salesman strategy. And it, that's probably an insult to used car salesmen out there because it's, it's much worse. Um, that it's all, it's all about the transaction. It's all about, you know, getting, getting that done, taking the customer's money and saying, good luck. And that isn't resulting. We're not responsible for anything. Yeah. And, and that's not making anything better. How should that work? Like, how do people buy cyber? Isn't it the, I wasn't on sort of like the acquisition of cyber side, but like this Gardner quadrant, does that sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that is, uh, I guess, a measuring system, a measuring stick to help the vendors or customers or prospective customers, um, companies, I guess is a better term, uh, to, 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 you know, guide them in buying what they, they may or may not need. There are a few problems with that. The Gardner quadrant system is often outdated. We, we were, for example, Field Effect was marketing a managed detect and response um, service well before it was defined in Gartner. And ironically, at the time, we had a hard time, you know, gaining traction. Because that's always looking at like existing sort of technology and threats and looking backwards saying like, oh, these people accomplished this, but not looking forwards in terms of where the industry is going. Yeah. So, so that, that, you know, that, that is a, it is a useful classification system. It is just behind the curve continuously. The second thing is I don't think uh, businesses actually necessarily know what they're looking for. Um, yeah, like how would you be educated? If you're like a, a law firm, an accounting firm, you got 100 employees, you don't have like a cyber guy or girl. And no, you, like how, no. do you, how do you go about doing that? So, so I mean, that's, that's ultimately the, the realm that, you know, field effect sits in, uh, the, the, the small to medium business space, because, you know, it is infeasible for every company to have an IT team. And in, in our experience, I mean, an IT team is good. Um, they have expertise, but they may not necessarily be, you know, security experts. Is, is that kind of like Shopify for cybersecurity? Because Shopify is really arming you. You don't have to worry about building a store. You don't have to worry about managing inventory. You don't have to worry about it. They're arming the rebels, if you will, against Amazon. Like, are you giving world-class technology to small and medium-sized businesses as a means to, like, you don't really have to know all the ins and outs of cybersecurity, but then it becomes trust-based. Like, why would I trust you over another vendor? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think trust takes time. You, you, you don't just uh, magically get trust right out, out of the gate. And I, and I think that is, a, uh, that is something we put a lot of time into building. We take time to create a customer relationship, uh, ask customers what their needs are, what are their problems, and then um, you know, tell us about your network. How can we help you? Um, and you know, early on in that process, I, I think it becomes clear that we're not just out trying to sell software in a commoditized way. The first thing we do is do an external view of the network and, and identify, okay, here's a problem right here. We want to help you fix problems. It's not just here is a solution that you have to run with. It is all about us helping you be better, fixing problems, and sustaining that moving forward. And that, and that is largely a, a component that I don't think most vendors in the cybersecurity industry get. They are more interested in showing you, check out this really cool interface, which you know, no one in your company is probably going to know how to use. And then if you don't see something, it's like, oh, it's not our fault. It was in the interface somewhere and you yeah. didn't. Yeah, you didn't see the logs. So why, why didn't you action that? And that, and that I mean, I, I think the assumption that the average business is going to care about cybersecurity is, is a, false, uh, a false starting point. Because businesses, you know, you buy your computer hardware, you get your IT set up. Uh, if, I, if I'm a business and I, you know, out there, I'm not starting my day off thinking, oh, I can't wait to buy some cybers or understand <laughs> some you know, cybersecurity. And um, that is the baseline. Right. That that I think for uh, you know an effective solution, that's what you're dealing with. You're 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 dealing with a company or a customer that 
doesn't care about cybersecurity, but you need to help them. The baseline of the, the, the interface could be an office manager, not somebody who has a computer science degree or somebody who has any background or interest in cybersecurity. So having a system that you know, is set up and built and implemented to work with people who don't necessarily care uh, or will care or, or, or should even care because that's not their job, um, that's what we do. Well, that's a good point, right? Like you're not trying to make them care. You're just trying to say this isn't a worry for you anymore. Yeah, yeah. And, and when something comes up, here's a very concise way of dealing with it. Not a, you know, a series of links, go Google this, learn how to implement a VPN, learn how to use a firewall, learn how to patch your system. Um, it's, a, it's a guided approach to this is specifically what you need to do. Let's flip that around. And uh, what people don't often see, which you can add uniquely, is sort of what's the mind of the attacker? Like if you're looking at acquiring um, valuable information from a company, Walk me through that whole process. Like, how do you think about that? How do you go about doing that? What does that look like? So initially, an attacker is going to profile the target, and that, and that can look like different things. So if, if you know the, the target has online services, they'll probe those services to see what's there. Uh, are there any email addresses on your website that uh, are really easy to uh, you know, identify? What type of social media presence is there? Um, you know. And that ultimately will lead into typically a social engineering campaign, uh, either in the form of you know an, an email that is received that looks really normal that you want to trust and hopefully will get you to click on something or double click on an attachment, or it'll go to your phone and click on that and that exploitation occurs. Um, the other approach that we see quite a bit is uh, people don't use multi-factor authentication with um, just a basic email setup. So brute, force, brute forcing passwords works. Somebody gets in, we'll scope out your inbox and, and see what's there, who are your customers, uh, what, what's your routine, and then they will uh, perform perhaps a financial redirection. So in that case, they would get an idea of what your entire portfolio is and email all of your customers and say, um, hey, here's your new payment instructions. And they will have all the outstanding invoices already uh, you know, listed and ready to go. So they can immediately, um, you know, say, you, you know, you owe us X amount. This is where I want you to send this money now. And that is remarkably and surprisingly effective. Yeah. And hard to track down, even though there's like a total with bank accounts, we'll come to cryptocurrencies and sort of ransomware later. But with bank accounts, it's, it's easy to see where the money goes. It's really hard to get the money back once it's gone. Yeah. And that, that's conventional sort of attacks, right? Versus, um, sort of somebody like Boeing or General Electric or sort of Cisco who would have a lot more valuable IP and probably worth a zero day or sort of like developing a custom exploit. Can you walk me through like how that would work? Yeah. Hypothetically, so, of course. So I, I, you're, you're interested in more of the pointy end of the stick? Yeah. Yeah. So the, uh, you know, the way, the way exploitation works is um, I, at least in, what specific platform you'd like to walk through? Uh, let's walk through Windows. Windows, okay. Um, so if you're going after a Windows box, uh, it, it's either a server or, or workstation. And typically servers, if they're internet facing, gives you the ability to, to hit it direct. So if you have a, a zero day and um, you know a, a web uh, server, for example, that is something you can directly access and, and exploit. And that, that is a very... Um, direct way, I guess, of, uh, of attacking. The other approach is uh, you, you have a Windows client, you're, you're sitting at your desk, you have a laptop, and you're just you know typing away, and you get an email. Uh, that is probably the most common way. And what, what that looks like is, again, back to the, the scenario where you're trying to convince somebody uh, to trust an email, so they click on a link. What happens? Like, walk me through, I click on this link. Yeah, yeah, like... so, so the first thing that happens is, uh, you know, the browser uh, would be exploited. So whatever browser renders that link, a uh, uh, web browser exploit would would basically gain code execution, and and modern browsers are, are definitely getting better at per, you know protecting against that type of thing. So you know Chrome is every browser has a sandbox now. Most browser flavors are uh, you know some measure of Chrome. So even Microsoft Edge is now based on uh, Chromium. So and so is Brave, and so is like Firefox, isn't there? Is it? No, no, Firefox is not. 
Okay. I think they're still rocking their own their own setup. For now. They just fired their threat team. <laughs> oh jeez. I didn't even hear that. <laughs> um so so yeah, you gains execution inside the browser, and then the goal is then to uh gain privilege in the uh uh in the uh, in the operating system. So that could constitute a sandbox escape to get out of that browser sandbox, uh a privilege escalation to ideally uh, execute at a higher privilege level to to basically nullify any security on the host and ideally get execution in the operating systems kernel and once you're there um it's largely game over so what, what but you get kernel on an individual host walk me through how you like how does that become network access to at a super admin level or so so once you have that you you there there really is no barriers to do to, to doing anything on that host so if you want to open up comms back to mothership you can do that. If you want to access a whole bunch of data, uh, you can do that. But how do you open up comms? Like, isn't everybody monitoring these links now in terms of like how you exfil information? Uh, no, no. It's a, so, so we're kind of diving into why this is actually a really hard problem and why any specific pillar doesn't work. So if, if you only buy a network monitoring solution, um, you won't see really anything that I've described thus far. If you buy an endpoint only solution, there may be hints of things that have happened depending on the um, um, sophistication of the endpoint solution. But as soon as it gets so uh, particularly deep uh, in the kernel, th th you're not going to see that. So it's a very challenging <laughs> uh, position. That, that's why having a holistic approach is so important. You need network, you need endpoint. So if you get by either one of those things, the other will pick it up. And how does that work? Like on a, a particular client, I can understand how those things communicate. But then how do you how do you take an attack on one company and then translate that into a defense on another company with something you haven't seen before? So I guess largely that depends on how well the cybersecurity solution is implemented. If it is part of a, a network where you can dynamically signature an attack quickly and create an artifact, we'll say, that can be applied across the network of other customers. Uh, that is a way to combat against that. I mean, the zero day problem is, is something that's always going to be there. I, I think this is something that a lot of vendors don't actually realize that no matter how much you lock down your operating system, there's always going to be a creative group out there that does things better, that can get around it. I mean, if you look at Apple, uh, Apple iPhone for the past, I don't know, we'll say decade, uh, they've been adding an increasing number of security mechanisms into the operating system that largely limit an app writer to only being able to do specific things. But that is largely crippling from a security standpoint because all you need to do is get around these set of mitigations and you now can own any Apple device in the world. And a really scary thing is recently a company called Vupin, uh, that is, you know, they buy zero day exploits. Um, not sure where they go after that, but what they do is, well, I can speculate, but uh, they buy zero day exploits. And where um, they, they, they posted something recently where they said, we're, we're full up on iOS privilege escalations. Um, we get enough. Yeah. And, and if that isn't a wake up call uh, to, to Apple, I'd, don't really know what would be. That's, that's basically the industry is saying, yeah, your operating system is not as secure as you think it is. That, it's kind of like the Great Wall Theory, right? Like you have this big wall around, but once you're on the inside of that wall, it's like there's no defenses after that. Yeah, and, and that perfectly describes Apple. And that, that actually describes every mobile operating system out there. Well, Android, talk to me about the specific challenges with Android because they have their, they have like a host of other problems that aren't, common occurrences that have to be dealt with. Like everybody has a different version of Android that they're running. It's always out of date. It's Yeah, so Android's an interesting beast because um, a lot of... It's the most common platform, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and it gets a lot of positive, um, how do I say reviews, but um, attention out there because it is an open platform. It's you know, a you security could download, nightmare. <laughs> yeah, you can download the source code and you can see what's running. And that is a component of a secure operating system, I guess, that... You know, the average person can go out and audit what's there. The average person could, if they want, take that, download it, compile it, put it on their phone, and maybe add some additional bells and whistles. The concept is very noble. The reality of it is not so great. 
because what we have today is there is the main Android branch that you know evolves that um, Google releases. Android 11 just got uh, recently released, um, and vendors will take that and they will adopt it as is, or they will customize it, or they will um, you know take pat- particular parts of the uh, what's um, called a change history. It's basically the the changes that have been made to the code base, and when that when that is taken in context with um, vulnerabilities, the fixes may or may not make it in. So you could have, you know, the latest Samsung phone running Android 11 that doesn't actually have all of the security fixes that the main Android branch has. Right, because somebody's accepting or rejecting. Yeah, yeah, and and I can tell you that 100% certainty. Um, I have not looked at Android 11, but what I have experienced over the past two decades, there are problems in the Samsung version that have been missed because humans, again, are part of the equation. Uh, and you know, on the list, it'll say, you know, CVE fixed, CVE fixed, but those fixes aren't there. Bad guys or attackers will know that and they will exploit that. And there is literally nothing you can do to defend against that if you are a target. And that is a pretty frightening proposition. So you would rather go up against an Android phone than an iPhone if you were an attacker? Uh, that's an interesting question. I, I think the odds of getting uh, exploited are higher on Android, although the um, the nature of Android also creates a, a scenario where there's so many different flavors of Android. It makes it much more difficult to create a mass attack. Whereas on iOS, because it's the same version of the uh, of the operating system across the board on every device, if you can find a problem in that, you get all those devices. On Android, um, you get the nuances. I put nuances in quotes of some of the decisions that individual vendors will make that that makes it very difficult to take an attack on Samsung and apply it to I don't know Google Phone or a ZTE Phone. So it's I would say generally it's the, the security position on Android is 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 worse. Um, but, um, you know, the, the odds of being hit in a mass attack are, are potentially lower, but if somebody is targeting you, I would say that the odds of, you know, you, them being successful against you are higher on Android for sure. As, as phones or, you know, if you want to call them personal computers, it's like, those are our personal computers, right? Uh, more so than we think become more prevalent. They'll become the surface of which gets commonly attacked. Walk me through, like, how does phone exploitation even work? Like, how do you, is it the same sort of system that you would use for Windows or Apple? Is it different? Like, how do you attack the phone? You have this thing on you all the time. It's got a mic, it's got a yeah, camera. Yeah. So the, the unfortunate answer is the exact same way you'd go after every other type of computer. Uh, iOS is just an operating system. Android is just an operating system. There's There's no... There's no special features that make it impervious to attack. There, there are different security mechanisms in place that an attacker needs to get around, but it's the same deal. So if I'm going after your Windows laptop in the scenario that I described where I send you an email um, on, on mobiles, uh, it's the same thing. And it's actually worse in some cases. Um, uh, about a year ago, uh, a company out of Israel called um, NSO, NSO Group they got busted for having a WhatsApp uh, zero uh, zero click mechanism. So there, there's some quick lingo dive here. Uh, one click versus zero click. One click is you have to social engineer somebody to the point where they can click on a link and exploit the phone. Zero click is where there's nothing you can do. You are just owned and you have no idea. By, by You don't even see a message. Yeah. Like you're just... Yeah, no decision on your part. You're sleeping in the middle of the night. In this case, uh, NSO Group, Um, you know, sends you a malicious bit of content via WhatsApp, assuming they've been able to, you know, figure out your WhatsApp ID uh, and then exploit your phone. And congratulations, Uh, that that whole step of getting around sandboxes, privilege escalation, that it's all the same concepts. But in this case, it is a direct way to attack a device that you own. So previously, like tools like that were only in the hands of governments and they weren't generally targeting individuals or small corporations. Has that changed? I think the accessibility is different. There's like an asymmetry to this, right? Like some some person, some teenager, guy or girl sitting in their garage can literally 
have a massive disproportionate impact. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's. Uh, I, I sorry, I'm thinking of the the attack on Twitter recently and how how you know that was a social engineering yeah. attack. And, uh, yeah, and and you know, in the context of going after mobiles, I mean that that's that's it all comes down to the accessibility of the attack vector and the the creativity of the person running the the attack vector. So I was thinking, you know, with with NSO group. You know, there's there's a lot of articles on them about who they sell to and don't sell to. Um, they have a whole group now, or a whole internal group within the company that I've read, uh, dedicated to making sure they make ethical decisions. I don't personally trust that they're making ethical Why decisions. Why do you need a group to make ethical decisions? I mean, that's an indication that you know ethics weren't a component in the founding of the company. Uh, but that's a, probably a whole other discussion. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I think you know the 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 point that the attacker and what that looks like is is you know it it's much more plausible that it is not an intelligence agency. Um, you know, you, you look at the 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 groups that are running out of uh, you know other countries. I'll, I'll pick on India a little bit just because I've seen some you know some IP reports on you know some some problems coming out of there. But firms of social engineering efforts. Um, you know, it, it doesn't take a lot to go after Android that's two years old and how many, yeah. I haven't looked at the statistics of how, you know, what the, the market coverage is of, of Android versions. I'm pretty confident that if you're rocking a version of Android that's a year old, you're probably a pretty big target. And, and that, you know, again, I don't mean to pick on Android, but that is just a, a reality of how that ecosystem has evolved. People don't really realize the scale at which this affects the economy, right? Like you see these ransomware attacks, which I want to come to next in terms of like $20 million paid in Bitcoin. But what you don't see is the trillions of dollars in IP that have been transferred to foreign governments over the last decade. Recently, we've seen a lot of intellectual property leaks. Um, I, I kind of feel that, you know, it's... If you were going to steal intellectual property and then create a competing product with traces, which you know Huawei got busted for that. Yeah, well, uh, I want to come back to Huawei. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> internal rage meter just went up. Um, you know, it, it's a much more you know deniable scenario where you know things hit the internet and people say, okay, I just it was out there now, so it's public domain knowledge. So the you know having separation from the attacker. Uh, and the beneficiary of, of, you know, the results of the attack, um, you know, it makes a lot of sense if, if one's goal was to get a hold of somebody's intellectual property. I mean, once it's out there, everybody's going to consume it. Um, you know, you look at the leaks of the, the whole Eternal Blue leaks. It's a series of tools from uh, an, uh, NSA that got leaked, um, yep. Windows vulnerabilities. Yeah. Um, you know, went to WikiLeaks. Was that NSA or was that the CIA ones that got released? Vault Seven? No, that was that was NSA. That, I, was I, there C- CIA ones, or am I making that up? No, there was one that was rooted in uh, um, Vault Seven. Was was that group? Uh, was that leak? I guess um, the one I'm referring to um, was uh, from NSA, and it was a, it was a whole treasure trove of, of tools. And th- this one was particularly interesting because it really th- there are events that occur that destabilize, I guess, the defensive posture. Ransomware in general, I don't get how it even exists because it is the most benign, sorry, it is the easiest malware to detect and stop. How there's even an industry around that blows my mind. But the attack vector uh, that people use to wrap ransomware, the payload, weaponize the, that chain that I talked about earlier, basically allowed a, you know, a point and exploit capability on patched Windows machines. So walk me through ransomware. Like what what happens? Uh, depends on the flavor, but the uh, the 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 overall goal is to extort money uh, out of the the victim. So there's different ways to do that. If you attack uh, an individual, you would uh, you know potentially encrypt their personal photos, um, credit card information, maybe other personal compromising information, and then um, say, "Give me X amount of money." Or I'm going to I'm going to you know expose all your photos, or I'm going to delete it all. When it comes to businesses, it's more of going after intellectual property. Where if a particular workstation gets compromised, ransomware runs on that workstation, 
encrypts everything, potentially deletes deletes everything at the time, uh, typically making a copy of it because there's value in that. And then we'll go through all the network shares and do the same thing. So uh, there's one one particular, uh, there's different groups, I guess, of, of ransomware actors out there. Some that are, uh, you know, won't call a bluff and others where if you say, ah, I'm not going to pay you, they will 100% follow through on what they're going to do. And this weird, I guess, sub industry has emerged from ransomware actually being a thing and being accepted where companies will actually act as negotiators. So if you think back to those really cool movies where, you know, there's a really cool ransom or sorry, a hostage negotiator uh, trying to talk somebody out of, out of the scenario <laughs> that exists for ransomware. And it, it, it drives me do the bargaining for me. Yeah. 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 Why is that a problem? Like, do, do you, like, do your customers have ransomware problems? Like, oh no, because they, they, they use covalence. Uh, we, we protect against that, that vector. Um, uh, but the one but thing, how, how do you stop that? Like, if it's that easy to stop, why doesn't everybody stop it? I, I wish I had an answer to that. I, I don't think, um, you know, a network monitoring solution will not stop net, uh, ransomware. There's nothing you can do about that. You need that. to be on host. Yeah, you, you have to be on host and you have to have a measure of sophistication uh, and uh, tradecraft to, to identify and block it. It's we, we've, we've seen, we have some coexistence scenarios where uh, I, I won't identify the companies, but they are very, very large, successful companies, so cybersecurity companies. And, you know, the ransomware gets by them, but we stop it. And it blows my mind that, you know, based on the Because for you, that's easy. Like, that's, yeah, not, yeah, that's not a big thing no, that you're worried about. It is, it is a very, very basic profile to stop, identify. Um, I don't know. I, I might be jaded because I've been doing this for 20 years and... Um, in the grand scheme of uh, things that I've been a part of, uh, ransomware is definitely low on the sophistication bar. Do you think it would exist without cryptocurrency and anonymous payment forms? Because it always seems to be, at least in the news, it's always like you need to pay in Bitcoin so I can like run away with this money. And yeah, I would say it definitely be harder because that is definitely a very convenient payment structure uh, to pay to pay with Bitcoin. Um, the, I'm just thinking in the cases where we, we've seen financial redirections and those are anonymous accounts that are used and then torn down. Um, so there's there's definitely... How yeah. hard is that to track? Like if you're sort of like the FBI or the an, another three-letter agency, like to follow that path? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know about that. Uh, it's not my, not my background. Um, but I would say the... The challenge would not necessarily be the difficulty. It would be the average person or business getting any agency to care, to track it down. Because that, you know, intel agencies, law enforcement agencies aren't sitting around waiting for things to do. They, you know, there's really big problems they're going after and trying to fix and solve. And, um, you know, a small company, uh, you know, a law firm getting ransomware uh, is, is just low on their... Well, it's not even a matter of payment for them. In some cases, it's life or death for the business because you can effectively turn the business off overnight yeah. and just eliminate it, especially if you're small and you, you don't have these sort of like big bank accounts to pay. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm aware of um, you know businesses that have been shut down because of ransomware. The, the, the payment is just too high and uh, the, it's much easier just to say, okay, <laughs> fold thrown in the towel uh we're gonna fold up shop and maybe start again and um th this is ultimately why i don't like I, I get very frustrated that companies will pay ransom or not take the time to um you know hire a company ahead of time like it's much much easier and cheaper to be preventative and to 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 harden your your system and, and be ready for attacks. I mean that that is the reality of today. And anybody who thinks otherwise is you know they've got their head in their sand. Um, you're going to get ransomware. Bad things will happen, and hopefully it doesn't kill your company or compromise customer data. That's that's a whole other aspect of this equation that I don't think people take into consideration. If there are legal obligations to report compromises in customer data now, there are fines. I I, I remember. Um, before COVID-19 dropped, there was discussions about, you know, six-figure fines going to Canadian companies 
uh, if they are uh, ransomware, customer data gets compromised, and it is shown that they weren't taking the problem seriously ahead of yeah, time, so they didn't have the adequate security protections in place. What's adequate? Like that sounds so subjective. Yeah, yeah. I mean, is that back to that Gartner? I checked the box. You can't <laughs> sort of like fire me. <laughs> so, so if I was a, a you know virtual uh, CISO, I, I would probably you know reference the Gartner Quadrant to make sure that. You know the executive board is covered <laughs> in regards to liability. Um, There's almost like two layers to this, right? There's the apparent layer, which is like I want to solve cybersecurity, uh, but the real layer is like I want to keep my job. And the yeah. easiest way to do that is not take any risks and go with the industry standard. And ultimately, the, when it comes down to accountability, that is a safe way to go. It is unfortunately um, even if you're owned. Yeah, yeah, it's it's. It's the safe way to go, but it is not the best thing for the company. It is not, uh, it is not forward facing. Uh, it is. I think it's being naive in regards to the the type of attacks that are coming. So, if you're a customer, what, and you don't know a lot about this, what are the questions you should ask to sort of reveal the type of solution you're getting for real instead of sort of like checking the box? You know, right off the bat, I would say, how are you protecting my company? To tell me how you're protecting my company, like full stop. What happens when something goes wrong? And and you'll probably get a whole bunch of you know sales jargon. What's the difference between a good answer and a bad answer to that question? Oh God! If if somebody uses the word next generation, seamless, um, AI. We'll, we'll, we'll stop everything. Yeah, AI. We've got machine learning. Any of that? If any of that comes up, big red flags. So if, if somebody can give you a good answer to what happens when your system fails that gives you comfort, then I think that is a, that is a good position to move beyond. Um, when, I, when I said earlier that you know, the cybersecurity industry is like a, a bunch of unethical uh, used car salesmen, uh, it's, it's because there's so much jargon and salesmanship that goes into this. Uh, for example, the, the process of buying a car, um, what do you expect when you go to a dealership to buy a car? What, what, what do you want to walk away? Assuming you really like a car or a brand, what do you expect to walk away after a transaction occurs? The car. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, with uh, the, the current cybersecurity industry, there are sales uh, persons all over the place that will, will say, you know what you need is you need some wheels. And then another salesperson will say, I can sell you the engine. And another salesperson will say, I'll, I'll sell you the steering wheel. You probably only need the steering wheel, uh, but I can sell you that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be great. I got some rims over here yeah. too. And it is up to you as a, as, a, as a company to put those things together and make use of that. So you're cobbling together the solution yourself and each vendor, like no vendor is responsible then because Correct. it's like, oh, this person, there's a lot of finger pointing. Yeah. And ultimately the, the only working cyber solution, and I, I don't care what the, the, the sales point is, the only true working cybersecurity solution is one that looks at it from where's your data, how are you going to be attacked across the board. So it needs to include an endpoint component, a network monitoring component, a cloud component, potentially an IoT component, uh, an XYZ for things that we don't even need to know it exists yet. Th this is where this whole concept of next generation drives me nuts because people say we have this next generation thing and what I'm seeing right now is the exact same thing I've been seeing 20 years ago, regardless of whether it has a machine learning component or not. Like, what does that mean, next generation? Like, if you knew the next generation of exploits, you'd be... Well, well ultimately, it doesn't mean anything. Um, a, a good solution should be iterative. A good solution should be engineered to handle the future without needing to put a sales tag around a, uh, you know, this is what we have now. We call it the next generation thing that the world has never seen. P.S. It's got machine learning, AI, blah, 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 which ultimately doesn't mean anything if you are a buyer. All it does is confuse you. It drives me nuts. There's so much jargon in this industry in particular, right? And a lot of it is salesy. Like it's created by the yeah. sales teams, the sales force. The yeah, the, the number of times I have had to worry about this, uh, you know, these features that are sold uh, to businesses around the world, uh, being on the other side of the coin just years ago, uh, never. I, I've never had to worry about machine learning. Um, and by the way, 
existing machine learning implementations and a lot of solutions out there uh, is the exact same thing that, you know, I've seen in antiviruses back in 2005. They just didn't call it machine learning. It was just training analytics to, to look for anomalies. And So when you were an attacker, what did you worry about? Oh, that's an intimate question. <laughs> getting caught. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, uh, yeah, I mean, so as an attacker, it is a, um, it is a continuous balance between risk, uh, and losing a capability. And th this is, what does that mean? And I'm speaking from, um, you know, back when I, uh, you know, was at CSE, uh, it, it means that, you know, when I said earlier that on the, you know, that first pillar of cybersecurity, if you want to call it a pillar, there's an economy behind it. So there's a cost to building uh, capabilities to, to go after a particular target. Uh, if you lose that capability, that immediately is uh, an expectation of, okay, find a new one. And it's difficult. There's, there's cost to that. There's labor. Uh, and and that, that is a very big component that goes into the, the, I guess, the risk equation as to how you're going to approach an operation. Um, how aggressive you're going to be and different different you know agencies around the world will do different things i mean you look at china and russia it, it, they're remarkably aggressive uh with a lot of i don't want to say disregard to their own intellectual property and what they're using but they, they're certainly not quiet about what they're doing it's like spray and pray right yeah i, I find i find it really intriguing um, it makes it makes me wonder a little bit like do they have a an army of thousands of people in warehouses cranking this stuff out which they probably do, which is really scary. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that I always found really fascinating about intelligence problems was there's always a country with more people uh, who are just as smart, if not smarter than you, and just as good, if not better technology than you, and yet you're tasked with sort of defending or in some cases acquiring information against these people. And the hubris that sort of like goes into, oh, we know best. and yeah, yeah, that that was always an intriguing calculation um, back uh, back at CSE, um, and it's 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 a good debate to have, I guess. If if you've got um, you know something that took a lot of time to build, do you throw it down a hill and hope for the best, or do you protect it? Do you put shoulder pads and, and knee pads on it and, uh, you know, try to make it last as long as possible. And so talk me through that though. Like, how do you see that? Because, um, allied governments, friendly governments, whatever you want to call them have exploits that are zero days that they don't release that have huge national security implications. Like we've, we've seen some of those become public and have massive implications within the NHS. NHS hack in Great Britain, the result of a stolen zero day from an allied government? That one's tough. Um, like, should they disclose them? What's your, like, how do you think about that? So, so from what I, so full disclosure, I don't have as much, much exposure to what the internal debate is on that. I'm aware that it happens. Um, it, it's, I think a lot of it comes down to what the perceived value is gained versus lost. If you dis, if you if you don't disclose something and you use it operationally, uh, is there more good for the, the the mission, the country, its people by not disclosing it versus disclosing it and losing a capability? Um, yeah, it's a tough one because you know the the the, the adversaries of uh, allied governments aren't going to disclose. They're they're not going to care if they have something they can weaponize. They will use it, and I, I think unfortunately that is probably the the tone that is set globally that underpins a lot of these the, the decision making. Like if if you're being attacked constantly and having your intellectual your nation's intellectual property stolen, I mean you could disclose all the vulnerabilities you have and you know about as a nation, it's not going to stop them. Uh, it's just not going to. There, there are, you know, going back to the, the Vupin example of, um, there are more out there. Um, so there's a backlog apparently. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of, uh, I'm going to probably push some of your buttons here. So you might want to take a drink. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about, Huawei. I'm just going to leave it there. Expand on Huawei. Uh, so 
We've had many uh, what conversations. A, what a this. chestnut that situation is. Um, so Huawei's had a bit of a, an interesting, uh, less than smooth ride, uh, I, I would say. Really? Uh, they came out of nowhere with all this tech. Yeah, which which miraculously happened right after a Cisco leak, a giant Cisco source code leak. It's a coincidence. Yeah, so... Uh, you know, there's there's documented ties to uh, the Chinese federal government with that company existing. There is, I don't know if they were ever convicted. It was back in 2003, 2004, but there was a there was a very clear cut case that Huawei was using conveniently leaked intellectual property. This is back to you know, if I was going to steal your intellectual property, it is much more deniable if I leak it into the internet and then use it and come out six months later and say, oh, look, I just found this out there and I used it. Really convenient. Um, <laughs> Coincidence. And, and, yeah. And, and, you know, where we are today, Huawei basically, you know, price undercuts um, other, other vendors. And, it, you know, I ask, how do they get to that point? That, that sounds like they have a lower R&D budget. And how do you have a lower R&D budget? You, you get intellectual property via creative means. Um, you know, today with uh, them being banned from the U.S., uh, I don't disagree with that. Uh, I, ha I have different thoughts about the whole TikTok situation. Um, but wait, wait, dive into the Huawei thing. Why don't you disagree with that? I, why don't I disagree with them being banned? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with them being banned. Too, yeah, so, like, so I, I, I don't think there is a framework to build trust. I don't think they have earned that trust and given, you know, if, if a nation is going to re-kit their entire country with a new type of wireless gear, especially with the complexities of 5G, you need to trust that vendor. You need to be sure that the interests of that vendor uh, are at the very least not opposed to the interests of the country that you're in. And I, I don't know how anybody could possibly say that about Huawei. I remember when the Brits did this whole thing, like we're going to set up this accredited lab, we're going to test it, so we're going to allow British Telecom to use it, uh, but we'll test everything that's deployed. I remember just like that would fall apart in a second because the minute there's a zero day, you're going to deploy it right away, especially if it's leaked on the internet, and then you've deployed code that you haven't code reviewed, and then the whole thing just falls apart, and I'm like, okay, well. Well, it doesn't scale to the realistic pace of software development. Right. So let, let's let's imagine that a government does have a program in place where every iteration of source code, and these aren't small systems. We're, we're yeah, talking millions huge, of lines of source millions. code. Yeah. Let's assume you have a crack team of amazing source reviewers that can say with confidence, yep, this looks great. Uh, or better yet, they have a set of automated tools to be able to derive that answer, which is challenging, probably possible, extremely challenging. The realistic outcome is the time for, uh, let's say Huawei releases a new iteration. The time from that release, because if they are a vendor that actually believes in securing their product and that new release of the firmware has, uh, you know, fixes, time matters. You're, you're against the clock before, um, you know, vulnerabilities could be discovered and, and put out. Because all it takes is for them to release that firmware once, have somebody rip that firmware apart and identify differences between the old and new. So you're immediately up against the clock. And if this ideal analysis process is being slowed down in any way, you're immediately compromising the vendor and giving them the... Um, the argument that this system doesn't work because what they, and I don't necessarily disagree with that. If I was the vendor and my releases were being slowed down by a month, I would get pretty cheesed because yeah, it's not my fault. Yeah. You're slowing down fixes and, and, Oh, I'm sorry. Your, your routers just got hacked. That's on you. That's, that's not on the vendor at that point. So I don't think that program is, is, or that that concept is one that actually works. And the way to avoid that is sort of like just not allow that in your critical infrastructure? Or do you think it should be not allowed in any infrastructure? Your personal take. Oh, my personal take? I, 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 I'm, again, I'm, I'm completely fine with the ban. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're still allowed to uh, sell into Canada. Uh, I, I'm not aware of what the... Uh, I think it's not allowed in the, the... I mean, my knowledge is out of date, so we'll have to like fact check this. But I think it's not allowed in the critical components of Canadian telcos, but it's allowed on the periphery. But, so, I, I mean, but that's like silly when you think about it, right? Because you don't want to ever be held hostage to somebody who can 
who can turn that off and yeah. somebody who's more patient than you, right? Because you could just go 25 years with no incident and then all of a sudden there's an incident, but you've built up 25 years of trust and credibility. So the story you tell yourself is we haven't had an incident. It's cheaper because it's likely subsidized and not only R and D, but subsidized by the government. Yeah. So, I mean, ultimately this is, I, I don't have any problem with the, uh, Huawei being banned in the U.S. I would not. I would not argue about that. By the way, the the name of the vendor is Zerodium. Vupin was started. Sorry, Vupin started Zerodium. Oh, okay, they're and the they're the that ones that buy the zero days. Yeah, I always lump them together. Just you know, well, same parent company, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what do you think of Snowden? Oh, I feel like you're asking questions that is slowly taking years off my life. Uh, <laughs> So <laughs> I've been doing that since I met you. Uh, no, you're great, bud. I do not agree with what Snowden did in any way. And that is, that is putting it very, very kindly. Um, regardless of, you know, at this point, there's been things that he brought to light that has been declared illegal. The, the unfortunate assumption is that agencies, security agencies, intel agencies, are you know these devious groups that are like let's do whatever we can and i don't think the average person actually realizes how difficult that job is how normal the people are who do that job they have families they come in they want to you know solve a mission or solve a problem make things better and the way he went out uh with this giant trove of information which i'm going to come back to um completely ignores the 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 way that technical implementations get approved it's not like developers are sitting at their desk and say i have this great idea let's go do it and all of a sudden it's running in operations without any um you know accountability or review there is a team of lawyers depending on the size of the country that will look at that and say this is okay this is bad uh, i remember being at cse and arguing for something for i don't know how many years but there was there was a problem legally and it didn't get through and, and that that vetting process people take extremely serious and if something goes through that process uh there is a measure of legality to it there are a group of lawyers who honestly like to say no to ideas uh that have said yeah this is okay so the idea that anything that has been deemed illegal um you know, I, I'm not in a position to say that's right or wrong, but what I can say is the process that those things would have gone through. People underestimate the sheer size of the bureaucracy crazy. to get it anything is, it implemented. It is absolutely crazy. So, so that whole side of things, um, uh, I find unfortunate um, because the the byproduct of that is distrust for agencies that are working extremely hard to keep countries safe, and it is it is extremely disheartening for those people to you know get dragged through the mud publicly when the public doesn't actually have an awareness as to how much they sacrifice on a day-to-day -day basis like i couldn't count the number of long nights that i've seen people work um you know to, it it can break families it can break relationships and um, it has yeah definitely uh, so the other side of it is you know trusting his intentions so he he had gripes about you know those types of illegal, you know, uh, mass monitoring or mass surveillance programs in the U.S. Why did he go public with such a large archive that had nothing to do with that? Yeah. Why did he, you know, expose um, completely legitimate legal intelligence gathering programs uh, that have a ton of people's names associated with that? Why did he go out the door with that? And that, I think, is what I have a much larger problem with in that, you know, there was no thought process. I, you know, it sounded, it, to me, it seemed like more he was just giving the intelligence community the middle finger. Yeah, I mean, I sort of took away the same thing from that whole thing, which was even if he felt just in what he was doing, it would have had a, a different sort of feel to it when it came out. And in, you don't need to reveal the techniques. You can just reveal the details of the programs. But the actual techniques that he revealed, the software techniques, the exploitation techniques, that I mean, that, that definitely cost people lives, that had a huge impact on people working there. Yeah. And, and how, how far back did he set programs? How much did, 
you know, entire agencies need to go into damage control because some Yahoo decided that this thing over here was illegal. And then, oh, P.S., here's a whole bunch of other interesting stuff, unredacted, being released. Yeah, I think people think, oh, there's no names associated with it. But like on the original documents, there's definitely names. And I think we both assume that every intelligence agency worth their salt in the world has unredacted copies of all of those documents. Yeah, yeah. To the best of my knowledge, WikiLeaks doesn't receive redacted versions of things. Uh, so, I mean, that's that's largely my opinion on him. If he's so, you don't think he should be pardoned? A little part of me will die if he is pardoned. Why do you think he's in Russia? Is there is there something to that story? <laughs> I mean, the where, where's the safe place to go when you've uh, burned uh, you know a particular group like right into the it's pretty bad the when enemy's you're safe place is Russia. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'd be really curious to actually know what his living conditions are like right now, and uh, uh, you know, hopefully they're not comfortable. Um, but I mean, he brought it upon himself. There, there's other ways he could have done that. Uh, and, and come forward with... Uh, how, how could you have done that differently? What do you think? Well, I Like think internally, there's lots of outlets for that stuff. He said he followed that. There was no documentation released mm. that I, I can remember that he did follow those. Yeah, I mean, you, you look at the, the whistleblower protection in, that's in place now. Um, was that post-Snowden there or pre- Yeah, I, you know, I was just thinking that. I don't, I don't know whether it was post-Snowden. I mean, maybe his decision to do that would have actually improved the protections for whistleblowers. And, uh, you know, that's probably important to acknowledge, but it's... Um, I thought he was the best thing to happen to Lynchpin, though. I remember, <laughs> like, and I, I don't mean that in a negative way. I just remember, like, what happened in the immediate aftermath of that was they locked down the process by which people get hired. So, like... I don't think you or I would make it through today from start to finish um, because of our backgrounds and sort of different quirks yeah. of our personality. And, and so what happens is like post Snowden, you end up hiring, I call it the stormtrooper problem, which is like you end up basically hiring the same type of person, right? They're, they're sort of like never had a problem in their life. They um, get straight A's, they do all the right things. They tie their shoelaces the right way. And they come into the organization and they get promoted. And the process for promotion now is sort of like, here are the 10 things you need to do to get promoted because it's so sort of like laid out and so bureaucratic that you end up, you're 30 and all of a sudden you're, you're in charge of solving a problem that nobody's ever solved before. But you're in a group of people who all see the problem the exact same way. So you all share the same blind spot. So I remember when that started happening, I was like, oh man, this is like, great news for Matt because you're hiring in a way the misfits of the the industry, right? The people who don't want to go to meetings, the people who don't want to fill out the forms to go travel, the people who just want to be able to do their job. Yeah. I'm trying to think back of, uh, you know, what was there, was there an effect? Um, I, I don't actually know if I could speak to that without violating an NDA, honestly, but, um, yeah, we don't want to get you in trouble. Yeah. This year. Uh, yeah, I think how you characterize the the, the mindset of these organizations are, um, it's pretty accurate. I, I mean, the... Well, we both sat know. in meetings where they're like, oh, we can't hire this person because there's like a flaw in their background. And, and there's some legitimacy to that too, right? Like you're trying to manage top secret information. You're trying to uh, manage risk and manage an organization. But the flip side of that is like you're hiring effectively the same person. Yeah, you're, you're not wrong. I definitely don't uh, don't disagree. Um, I think from one one benefit to linchpin from that was definitely it pushed people out the door. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, uh, I, and I think that's a trend that uh, that continues um, uh, to this day. I mean, I'm I'm still, you know, full disclosure, actively recruiting for intelligence agencies. The people that are excited to leave and do something more and. Uh, you know, for the lack of better better terms, be unleashed to solve technical problems. Like there's that there's that hunger there, uh, and it's. Uh, I love that perspective of unleashing people that have sort of like had handcuffs before, and it's like now your ceiling is not bureaucracy, your ceiling is your own ability. Yeah, uh, I've been I've been doing this for 15 years almost as an entrepreneur in you know two companies, and I've gotten to witness people. Going, go through that unleashing 
process. And it is really cool to see um, how, you know, one month after they're, they're just blown away with what they are now afforded to do and what, 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 you know, I'm not saying don't do this. It is just, here's the goal. Here's the problem. Solve it. Let me know what you need. We'll catch up every once in a while. In Canada, people typically join join the company with um, you know one year leave of absence or a five year sabbatical component, and I always I always laugh about that because yeah I mean nobody's ever gone back. Well yeah so yeah so from a risk standpoint uh, that makes sense. So I, I never I never argue with that. Uh, but from a practical standpoint, uh, nobody's ever gone back, and it's become something that I've seen weaponized against the employee. Um, you know, oh, you're you're going to this company. We're not going to give you your one year uh, leave of absence, and it's like, okay, that is an extremely bad decision, and you're showing some really unfortunate true colors. Um, you know, in, in that in that does that ever conference. make somebody stay, or does it like no, push them out the no, door no, faster? No, pushes them out the door faster and motivates them. Yeah, chips on shoulders, man. There's something to the motivation that comes from that that just drives people. I mean. Google's Project Zero is largely built from people who have exited the um, intelligence in- industry with a chip on their shoulder. I don't know if that's worked worked out so well. But. I, w- I want to just sort of like end on some of the lessons that you've learned growing Field Effect now to 100 people. That's the critical phase for a lot of companies. Like a lot of companies break in this sort of like 40 to 100 people range because you start reaching the ceiling of the processes that you put in place, but also the ceiling of the people who've got you here. How do you think about that? How do you scale and how do you go beyond that and crack through that sort of ceiling? Uh, I I think the, the, the first component is, is making sure that everybody is going in in the same direction. Um, the, you know, you, you have to be very straightforward, frank, honest, uh, when you know looking internally, but also what the company goals are, and everybody needs to know what the company goals are. Um, I, I don't think that um, you know execution is ne- necessarily something that comes naturally uh, to a lot of people. And, and and for me right now, like one of my one of my biggest concerns as we approach 100, uh, as we go through COVID 19. I mean, when this COVID 19 started, there was you know a decision to be made to go aggressive or yeah. or or cower, I guess, from the scenario. And, you know, in my opinion, it was very clear we go aggressive because, you know, our competitors are probably going to be category B in yeah. damage control. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so you can get ahead. Yeah. So, so execution is, is a big part of that. And, you know, it, it takes a bit of time to, to understand what execution looks like in each particular problem or a given company. So that discovery of, you know, how do we execute as a group has been something that, I, I think is is extremely important, and and largely the the company is absolutely doing amazing at it, uh, and and that that I think is is one thing that um, you know always resonates in my head that you know everybody has great ideas, but how you push through is execution. You need to you need to material materialize those great ideas into things that uh, are reality. Is there anything else you want to say about the state of cyber before we wrap this up? Have I, have I, am I out of swear jar uh, no, content? Man, you, um, say whatever you want. Yeah, so I think we're already explicit at this point. So, <laughs> so, so, so I would say, um, you know, if you are a company uh, looking for help, uh, it, it, is, it can be a challenging thing. I, I think it's, uh, it's that uh, going to the doctor scenario when you have a pain, you don't want to necessarily find out what it is because, you know, people are naturally averse to bad news. Y- you can't, be like that with cybersecurity. If you don't have a cybersecurity vendor, if you don't have a company helping you out with that problem, um, get on it. Uh, it the, the, everybody is a target at this point. The, your company is not small enough uh, to, to be off uh, an attacker's radar. I have seen five-person companies, uh, actually, I've seen two-person companies uh, attacked and hit. So. Um, you know, my, my advice is don't be don't be afraid to to ask for help. Um, hello at fieldeffect.com. Yeah, the second thing I would say is uh, you know uh, anybody out there looking for uh, you know a really cool opportunity for a really cool company. Um, you know the experts of the world, regardless of what company you're working for right now, we're always looking for more people. That's amazing. My my kids call you Uncle Matt, but they also uh, whenever Elon Musk comes out, they say 
We know somebody who's going to do more than Elon, and we're sort of like, and they're, they're pointing yeah. to you. So we're looking forward to seeing how this progresses over the next couple of years. I, I don't know how to respond to that, but that's very, uh, that's very kind to of them. Thanks for chatting, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a good time.